um, that a lot has changed. And I feel that the future spaces um, is a very important topic. And I would include with the idea of what kind of spaces we're going to be working, living, and socializing in, also the question of mobility and how we're going to travel between those spaces and as well as how we're going to move and occupy those spaces. Um, like all things, the, the pandemic has definitely accelerated some things that were already happening. Um, it's already uh, made us be critical of some developments that were already occurring. And it's probably changed some things that we're having a difficult time that might not uh, survive what's happened the last uh, 14 months. So I, I just pulled together some thoughts and I thought I would start, if we wanna go to the first slide, there's kind of three sections to what I'd like to talk about quickly. So next. So the, the first for me is talking a little bit about how architects have thought about mobility. Um, primarily they've, uh, thought about it, and I'm as guilty as anyone in this, thought about movement in terms of space and form and um, building systems, and thought about it in a very, um, I would say, like a phenomenal way. And here I'm borrowing a, a term from uh, Colin Rowe on the phenomenal and, and literal, um, the difference between the two. I then want to talk a little bit about literal movement and thinking through the problem of moving people in air over the last year. And I'll show some examples that are older than that. And I'll show examples, actually, all of student work uh, from some of my students at the Angavanta, as well as some students in Los Angeles at UCLA. Um, and then the final thing I'll talk about is a little bit more directly technology and some of my work uh, with Piaggio Fast Forward, developing machines, specifically robots, that change the way we live locally and the way people move around in their local neighborhoods. So uh, next. First, to just talk about the, the difference between literal and phenomenal. What I mean there is that animation software in the 1990s uh, started to be used as a design tool. And it really changed the way we thought about assembly. Uh, next. So in this example of the Korean church that was mentioned, um, it was designed using animation tools. And you can see literally from right to left or left to right, each one of the building elements changes slightly. They, they have the same geometric primitive, but those geometric primitives were animated along paths and animated with flows to give the space a more dynamic character. And therefore, every single element uh, was unique in that animated sequence. And the, what allowed that to happen was both the introduction of animation tools to architecture rather than just dealing with static volumes, as well as the ability to document all of the components. So this building was built with some digitally controlled machines, but primarily um, the innovation here was that every one of the steel details, every one of the connections was partially automated in the design software so that we could have tens of thousands of unique details um, and be able to describe them for a builder. So next, you can see the effects of some of that on the interior, which led to more dynamic um, spaces where your eye flowed very much in the same pattern that the geometries were uh, animated. What's next? That then led to thinking about machines which were controlled by animation software. This is an example of a wall system um, that we built called the Blob Wall. Actually, this piece is um, at the Tyson Boromitsa. Um, 
And, and what was done is we used animation software to control robots that would cut a module in unique ways so that we could assemble them into complex forms. And this was about 10 years later, at the beginning of the 2000s. So next. Here's a little video of how that literally an animation software was adapted to control a robot. Um, and this is a technique for anybody that's kind of nerdy about this stuff called either inverse or forward kinematics, which was the adaption of animation controls to robot arms that had multiple joints for, for solving a, a curved path. So next. And that's the resulting assembly of those found objects that had been uniquely cut by programming a robot with animation tools. So next. So for me, um, I spent about 20 years using animation for making forms and spaces and designing exteriors and interiors, as well as for um, animating and controlling building components. Um, this was a, an experiment that was done with uh, Christian Moeller, where we were asked, or I was asked to <clears throat> make a, a, participate in a competition for the London Olympic Park. And Christian and I worked together to use uh, robotic arms to dynamically move a dome. And, and in this proposal, it was the first time I'd ever thought about having a building move or, a, a, or an element of a building physically move. And for me, it marked a, a jump from simply using motion as a design tool to starting to think about mobility in the built environment where buildings, instead of being static, could actually have elements that moved. And it's funny, once you get a, that idea, you realize from doors and windows to elevators, escalators, there's a lot of movement that happens within buildings. And I think now more than ever, how people move and how they're mechanically moved um, is a, a, a very important contribution architects can make to the built environment um, in terms of health and safety. Next, I then went through some um, a series of prototypes about thinking where the appropriate space for movement was. I have to say I was thinking of it more in terms of things the scale of rooms rather than this at the scale of building systems. This is a thing that um, we did for the Interior Festival in Cordric, Belgium where I was asked to design a tiny house. So um, our approach was to design a single room that had three occupiable surfaces and that could be moved both to present those occupiable surfaces flat to, to gravity, as well as moving them so they could follow uh, daylight and view. So in the next three sections, if you go next, you can see this is a, a large dining table, um, a kitchen, um, a, small, a couch, and that all of the other furniture disappears into the ceilings and the walls when you rotate it, like the, um, like the lighting or a lamp on a boat that always stays level. Next. That's then the, the washroom, the WC, the shower, the closets, things like that. Next. And then a, a bed and a couch and a work table. All, and you can see then what was the dining room table disappears in the ceiling and the underside of the table is a, is a light. So all the furniture disappears into the walls as the house rotates. What, I think is probably the most valuable for me was not the spatial exercise, but what you see the mechanism that moves this, which is the, the robot. So we prototyped that for the festival. It's next. Here you can see a small model we built 
Uh, and if you look inside, you'll see that the furniture rotates inside the house. So it's all movable and it all stays level. So your things don't fall on the floor and the furniture disappears into the walls when you move the house. And here we're manipulating it with a standard industrial robot and filming it with a second industrial robot. Okay, next. For the exhibition, we built a app that you could download, that visitors could download on their phone and control the robot with. And so here you see a scale model to test that. And in a minute, you'll see some of the details of that model. So it, it had two uh, motor controllers. It had, um, you know, its own power and it had a Wi-Fi antenna so it could communicate with people's telephones or tablets. And it was the first time that I'd ever in the office designed an app to control something um, that was a building element. I always did it for uh, manufacturing, never for the manipulation of a room. So next. It, for me, this connection of an app and a movable room, and then this is a, a 20% scale uh, prototype of both the robot and the shell of the house. And again, this was really meant as an experiment to think about what it would be to live in a dynamic changing space and how you would um, both mechanically move that space as well as how you would control the movement of that space. So don't worry, I wouldn't ask anybody to be living in this. It was really uh, a, a, an experiment in innovation in terms of control systems, robotics, and lightweight architecture that is light enough that you could move it practically. Okay, next. So, so this idea of mobility and transformation um, it's something that over the last decade has, has really had an impact, especially on the way we work, um, but also on the way we travel. So if you think about office spaces today, um, there's a, a significant amount of time that people are spending not at a desk or in a cubicle, but moving around a workspace. Uh, a significant amount of time having meetings, um, meeting in spaces which were not necessarily intended for work. Uh, so the meetings that happen over uh, coffee or snacks, the meetings that happen around couches um, or leisure lounge settings, the meetings that happen out of the office, it's changed the way both the office spaces are designed and even the way um, work is conceived. So with um, desk sharing and hot desking, with um, leasing office space, having a membership to offices um, with different locations in the same city or different locations around the world, these are all new ways of working that are connecting um, digital location technology. They're connecting apps and reserving and booking those spaces, um, digital management of those spaces. So you know uh, how efficient they are and how to, to operate and maintain them. Um, and, and there's a real, what I would call an intersection of the physical and the digital that's impacting the way we occupy spaces today. So uh, it's been probably eight years ago, I became the design advisor for physical and digital space for a company called Curbside. And Curbside invented the idea of taking a physical store and treating it like a fulfillment center. So they would gather the inventory of a store 
they would put it in an app so you could purchase uh, digitally. And then instead of going into the store, you could go pick up what you ordered curbside rather than having it delivered. So it was eliminating the delivery and shipping, but applying the digital shopping to brick and mortar stores. So here you see the very first iteration of their app a long time ago. Um, and it was my job to figure out what was the physical manifestation uh, of curbside in relation to all the stores they were powering, which was Starbucks, CVS Pharmacy, Target. Um, they ended up being acquired by a company called Rakuten, which is the, the largest digital um, shopping platform in uh, Japan and the second largest in the world after Amazon. Okay, so next. So you see here that you shop using the app and you don't just shop the store, you say, I want a scented candle and it'll tell you where all the scented candles are close to you. Then you purchase it, you're notified when it's been picked and then you have a day to pick it up and what's important to the store is knowing where you are so that they know that it's ready when you come to pick it up. So next. So we built these modular pickup pods, which could be reproduced and they were, um, they had components so we could change the size of them. And what's kind of um, significant about it is in the top of that little column is a high frequency antenna which without having to turn on all of the data on your phone, it looks at cell towers and telephone numbers of its customers and it knows when you're within three kilometers. When you get within one kilometer, it turns on certain features on your phone to give it more accuracy. And when you get within about 300 meters, it sends a notice to a person that you're about to arrive. Even if you don't arrive, it warns the person that it's likely you will. So next. So that then as you pull up, there's a person waiting with your bag as you pull up. And at the time, the planners wanted to know what impact we'd have on traffic. And we found that the total transaction time was less than 13 seconds um, for the customers to pick up their packages. And here you see it's a shopping mall where there are, are literally hundreds of stores that people can shop from. And then these uh, curbside employees who are really pickers go into the mall, pick the product, put it in a bag, store the bag, notify the customer it's ready. And then when the customer pulls up, they're ready to hand it to them quickly. And, and about half of the customers would shop in the mall, but they would also just pick up the things they knew they wanted already using the curbside app when they either arrived or departed. Okay, next. And that's just an image of that interaction. Next. So for me, it was the first, um, you know, civic, you know, first public um, physical manifestation of this um, idea of an, an environment that was dynamic and changing. At the same time, we started a, a three-year project with Nike um, where I was approached by Nike to build a microclimate for NBA athletes. And this, this climate was really there to control the situation during a game, um, especially right before the game started and at at uh, the break in the middle of the games where athletes needed to be kept at a very specific temperature and readiness. So this is LeBron James. Um, you, you can imagine how effective LeBron James is when he can perform like this. It's impossible for him to dunk a ball with a 40 inch vertical leap in the first minute and a half to two minutes of a basketball game. And it's because even if he's warmed up to be able to perform like that, during the time that they introduce the players, have the national anthem and start the tip off, 
he's cooled down. So the advantage that a team has when a player like, like LeBron James can have an extra two minutes of performance at this level usually would decide the difference between winning and losing a game. So Nike decided to take control of the climate that the players are in for, the, for these critical moments in a game. <clears throat> and it was in response to the fact that, I won't say the team, but during a semifinal, a team that LeBron played against intentionally reduced the temperature on the floor of the arena because they knew that it would slow him down. And, and, you know, targeting a specific player like this is actually what coaching is all about. So next. So this microclimate chair is an environment which we attempted to come in physical contact with as much of a player's body as possible. You'll see some of the studies to do that. And then we, we took technology and integrated it into a piece of furniture so that either the athlete themselves or the, the trainers could control the temperature and environment of the athlete, including um, airflow, contact temperature, and moisture. Uh, and this is a thermal, this is a FLIR thermal camera um, showing somebody sitting in in one in a chair that was actually custom designed for one player. Next. So one of the fundamental elements of this is um, Piazzo chips. So each one of these chips uh, can be selectively heated and cooled. Next. Next. That's the first generation. This is the second generation where we had borrowed some professional basketball players to test out different uh, ways of maximizing contact with the chair. Next. That was the one that had the most contact, but nobody was willing to get in and out of it on national television. Next. Next. And here you'll just see all of the technology components that were embedded into the carbon shell of the chair, as well as all of the touch control systems that we integrated so that the athletes could get the chair where they wanted it. In the end, because um, Kobe Bryant was famous for having hot towels on him, like a whole blanket of hot towels before tip-offs, every player we put in it just turned it up until it hurt. So in the end, they just wanted it as hot as possible. Um, and very rarely did they want to use the, the cooling. And you see it's got fans. It has a perimeter that emits oxygen. It has the Peltier chips, and it also has uh, gel heating. And it, we even weigh the, the two water bottles they have to know how much liquid they're ingesting during a game. Next. So for us, this was the, you know, and that's with the fly net Nike fabric on the right over the top of it. And then the view from the back with the aluminum heat sinks to cool it. And the whole computer system, power management system, uh, scales, all of that technology is all hidden in the base. But so an incredible amount of technology went into making this chair work. Um, I took this to a few chair manufacturers and talk to them about office environments and work environments. And they said, we wanna do it, but come back when our competitor starts because we wanna do it with you. So didn't, didn't go anywhere with the furniture industry. Next. Oh, that's the largest and smallest player in the NBA sitting in it. Next. Um, this is a experiment that I also thought is a very interesting insight into technology in the built environment. Um, it's um, an EKG, contactless EKG headset with, um, with uh, augmented reality um, goggles connected with it. Next. And um, this, this is developed for 
measuring people's emotions as they move through physical spaces. So you can see on the stress chart on the upper right, I can't read it because of my eye surgery, but it measures um, how much focus or attention, I believe. It measures your fatigue or tiredness. It measures your um, peacefulness or calmness. And it also measures agitation um, or, or maybe stress. <clears throat> and so as you look at things, it looks at your eyeballs, it positions you in space and locates then what you're looking at. And it measures your emotional reaction unconsciously to what you're seeing. Obviously, you can guess this is going towards shopping and um, and and optimizing the shopping experience next. But we used it actually as a design tool. So this this is just we did this isn't anything we designed, but you can see this is showing a heat map where you see those areas where people are looking, and you can see the four graphs on top showing their emotions as they're looking at those things. And then you get a, uh, a chart of each one of those four emotions over time connected to things in a space that they were looking at. And you can do this through a virtual space or you can also do it in a physical space um, augmented. Next. So we use this for the design of an office building as a test. Um, you see in the center bottom, there are six different uh, window patterns. And we're building the whole envelope of the building out of carbon fiber and with these scoops. So we wanted to test and see which were the most pleasant, least stressful, least stress inducing for 22 people that we ran through the building. So next. So it, as far as I know, it's the first uh, augmented brain scan um, design tool. The first use of it in a building. Next. I won't talk so much about the building, but it's it's a 100% composite envelope uh, that we're building for medics, who's a uh, carbon and fiberglass cloth weaver. So with 20, 25 tons of off cut carbon, we're, we're building these uh, building um, envelope 100% of it in composite and even glazing it and lifting them all in place. Next. Next. These are the, this is the building envelope studies. Next. And this is the first mold for the first scoop that's under construction in Turkey currently. Next. That's the mold, the mold. And we, we reproduce about uh, you know, six to 10 panels off of one of these molds. So there's some repetition in them. Next. Um, I'll just skip through this. This is a, a factory where we're building a museum and a new engine plant for in, um, on Lake Como for Moto Guzzi. Next, using the same technology. Next, next, next. So this just, I want to show you, I, I used um, particle simulation to design a boat for myself. It was very interesting because the simulation tools were actually design tools. Uh, next. You can see here that the, the move, the literal motion of the boat was defined with particle simulation. Next. The form of it and was designed to move through water where water was modeled as a denser particle than air. Um, and all of the forms on the boat are there to keep it from flipping over as it moves through water. And I'll, have, I'll show you a short video next of that in operation. <clears throat> That's it under construction. Next. Next. So if you look at that center hull, which is that animation I showed you, which was driven by the particle flow, you can see how those chines or those edges are shedding the water and assisting to get it um, what you call reserve buoyancy, which is when the boat starts to go nose down, which is how the boat like that flips over. Next. 
those come into play and give you that additional reserve buoyancy. It also lets you make a sailboat that doesn't have a motor uh, in very light winds go faster than power boats. So this goes at about um, 45 kilometers an hour is how fast we sail typically. Next. So we use that particle technology over the last few years at the Angavanta to look at how to think about people moving in buildings and how people move today. Next. Here's an example just to show you how um, ready architecture was to think about some of the problems that come with a global pandemic. This is an example of a student project where micro mobility, meaning scooters and electric bikes and ground robots would be used to replace elevators and escalators and mechanical vertical transportation and where the indoors and outdoors could freely um, exchange where you'd get a lot of potential outdoor space that you could open when the season was good. So this is a four-year-old project, um, but it's more relevant than ever today when you need to have ventilation and you don't wanna put people in elevators with each other. Next. This is from the same time period. It's looking at how people use their stuff in a building. So when you don't just sit at a desk all day, but you move around in a building, you might like to have your belongings delivered to you at different moments of the day in different spaces in the building. Again, for hygiene, and um, the ability to, to keep social distance approaches like this are more relevant than ever today. Next. <clears throat> so what we're doing at the Angavanta and have been doing all year is modeling ventilation of air and the flow of air, as well as looking at how to keep social distance between people and to design space with that social distance and ventilation in front of our minds. Next. So these are just some very quick simulations. This is of a gym that might be in a workspace or a, a hotel. And these are agents which are programmed to always stay two meters away from each other and to run through a circuit of activities, but we're not animating them to go from point to point. Like using game engine software, we're giving them instructions and objectives, and they're finding solutions to that based on where we put target activities in a space. So this is then for a cafe uh, or a canteen, cafe and a canteen, and you can see how they're keeping social distance. And, and moving with social distance. Next. And you can see then how a tool like that can then get applied in three dimensions to start to assist and direct design decisions where you can even break people down into cohorts. So here you see there are five different user groups and we can also maintain distance and uh, segregation of those five different cohorts, as well as keeping social distance and looking at the, the flow of air and ventilation um, naturally through the building. So th this is all things we were doing already. It's just now with the global pandemic, this approach to mobility and not thinking of spaces as beautiful rooms, but thinking of spaces as things people flow through that are filled with technology um, changes the way you design architecture. Next. Okay, then the third thing that I do, so I'm a professor, I've showed you that, architect, showed you the architecture work. Uh, I also am a founder and the CEO of um, one of now the 20 largest robotics companies in the Northeast called Piaggio Fast Forward, um, which is, uh, funded and founded by Piaggio who, Group, who makes the Vespa scooter and Moto Guzzi motorcycles. Um, next. 
and it's a, a robot to power local lifestyles. Now, with COVID, what we found is that this scenario of ride hailing, which in the United States has replaced walking. So the average ride hail trip is a little under two kilometers. So total walkable distance. But people are ride hailing for convenience when they go shopping um, and when they go to meet people socially, like go out to eat, go to a bar, go pick up food for dinner. They would just quickly call a car with an app, you know, very similar to what I showed you with curbside. You're using your phone now to summon services and these services are replacing walking. So we've come up with a mobility ecology. Next. Next. I, yep. Which, which looks at how to power people's walking by carrying things of different sizes for them uh, in highly pedestrian rich environments. And to do that, we learn a lot about pedestrian behaviors and kind of the cutting edge of our company is mostly architects. Next. And when I say cutting edge, it's really the, the cutting edge of understanding the built environment. So how you can move around without having to climb stairs and things, but use ramps, use sidewalks. We understand how people go through doors. We understand how people walk together, how much distance to keep. This is all um, observed, studied, quantified, and turned into algorithms for control of our machines um, by, a, by a smart behaviors group um, that really takes an architectural perspective to the way people and robots move in the built environment. Next. And I can't show you any of that study, but I can show you the results of that smart behaviors group. I mean, then we also have, you know, brilliant roboticists. I mean, we have dozens and dozens of perception engineers and roboticists. When I say cutting edge, I just mean the unique thing about the company. Next. So I have two heroes <clears throat> at the company. One is uh, Greta Schut Lohotsky who invented the Frankfurt kitchen by observing how people cook and how they move and diagramming how they move. The other is the cartoonist Chuck Jones, who said it doesn't matter how something looks, it's how they move. So again, instead of focusing on the form, we focus on the language of the mobility. And instead of um, telling telling a robot how to operate, we actually have an, a robot that observes people and moves with people and optimizes that movement the way uh, Shoot Lohotsky did with the kitchen. Next. So this is one of uh, Greta Shoot Lohotsky's diagrams of a conventional kitchen on the left and how it's optimized by getting smaller, it actually works better smaller in the Frankfurt kitchen because it optimizes the motions and movements and their proximity. Next. This is Chuck Jones on the left. You can see those spline curves that describe the energy and movement of the, the nine, eight or nine different characters. <clears throat> Next, there's a little video of a Chuck Jones. So you see how Porky Pig balances, how he accelerates, how Porky Pig decelerates. All these things we, we literally quantified into algorithms and animated and controlled the robot with to make sure it communicated with bystanders what its intent is. Next. So this is an example of one of our products, the Gita robot. Um, they operate indoors and outdoors. They don't have a GPS. We don't need to map anything. They have one button to interact with them so anybody can use them. Um, they're all over the United States. I've got a couple videos that I think our customers can explain it better than I can. Next. Uh, next. Oh, that's YG, his birthday party. I mean, we want these things to be well designed so they don't turn spaces into Amazon warehouses, but have people have a pride of ownership of them. Next. 
Um, I'll just say that that to design this, there's uh, a range of from the product to how it moves to the website we describe it with to the app that you use to manage it to how it rolls out of its packaging. There's a, a whole range of things to think about consistently in terms of the digital and physical aspect of the experience of a robot, very much like an intelligent environment. Next. The life of restaurants changed this year in 2020, and we had to discover new ways of meeting our customers where they were eating. So delivery became a huge, very significant part of how we were going to meet our customers' needs. The margins in a restaurant are very small, and the delivery costs for us meant that we were operating at a loss for every delivery that we made. And then the delivery co-op came along, and we were able to sort of look at a model that's very sustainable for the restaurant, great employment for the driver, and extremely good value for the client. In the age of 2020, we're standing here thinking about how are we going to deliver one of America's great meals, the Thanksgiving dinner, to a person via a robot. I love the idea of this cute little robot rolling up, and you open him up, and here is this beautiful Thanksgiving dinner turkey and dressing and all this stuff. It could be the wave of the future for us. We have to think outside our boxes. We have to figure out how we can spread joy from here to there. Yeah, half of all the food deliveries in the United States are under a mile and a half. And so we're working with business customers um, who have our robots for delivery. We've got business customers who are landlords for um, what's called um, planned communities with, you know, maybe 4,000 occupants um, in, a, in a dense suburban environment where they provide them as an amenity. We're in dozens of U.S. airports. So we have some business clients. This is kind of our most fun um, client in Lexington, Kentucky for food delivery. And then we also have some customers that, that we film talking about how they use the robot. Uh, next. Three words that I would describe the great city of Atlanta, entrepreneurship, culture, and art. I am Dr. Lakeisha Hallman, Dr. Key. I created Support as a Verb in 2016 to create opportunities for black businesses. I think Jita is a part of that revolutionary change. This city has become an amazing pedestrian city. Jita is the new innovative vehicle for pedestrians. And then finally, um, we also are taking our sensing hardware and software and solving problems for other robotic companies. Um, I think a lot of people will know the Boston Dynamic Spot which you drive like an aerial drone with a remote control. And not everybody's comfortable driving with a remote control. And it's sometimes in some environments not safe to be standing behind a spot driving it forward through a crowd. So we were approached to put our following technology on their robot and just recently announced a partnership with Trimble, um, the world's largest geolocation company, integrating our following software and hardware into their navigation products. And the proof of concept was on the spot, which um, they're a joint venture with. So uh, I think if you skip the next animation and go to the very last one. Yeah, Atlanta go one more. Atlanta is a more. city that does what's good for people. Any entrepreneur you can, go can come next. here and build a dream. My name is Blake. Yeah, so this is an example of that's our hardware and software right there on the front of the spot. And then with two Jitas. Okay. So that's uh, everything I have from looking at mobility and um, motion in buildings to thinking about it um, post global pandemic in terms of social distance and ventilation. 
And then finally, taking an architectural approach to the built environment and to the way people move in it and applying it to uh, following robots companies. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you for the, even when you say, that's it, that's all I have, that was a lot. And it was amazing, actually. No, I have um, a couple questions from the audience, and I hope you're ready. <laughs> the first question for the audience comes um, having to do with the, in, the furniture with the integrated technology. And how did the athletes react to this? Well, I, I, I think the one um, takeaway I would have for everyone is we overdid the options. So we had um, a machine learning approach to the data where we were going to use data analysis to tell the athletes what was best for them. And that was coming from the trainers. In the end, the athletes wanted to have control of the product. And the athletes also had insights. We would never have gotten by just data analysis. Um, so I would say that um, for me, having a thing be intuitive, um, not simple to use, but um, usable by people without training, and then watching how they use it is much more important than having a whole lot of features and telling somebody all of the things they need to do based on your preconceptions. There's in our robotics company, the worst thing that ever gets said is when I'll say, this looks like a product designed by engineers for engineers. You know, it's much better to design a product for more everyday people and then watch how they use it. Um, keeping that in mind, even what you said, there's another question here that sort of builds really nicely on that, which is asking about the findings of the emotion tracking. Um, did you make any adaptations to the design of certain things once you realized how people were emotionally responding to things? Um, you know, we did. The, the good news was of the 22 people recorded, um, by a vast majority, I forget, it was given to me in a percentage, but it would have been all but two or three people landed on a consensus, which I didn't expect. Um, we actually went into it pretty open. So uh, I wouldn't say there was a decision or a favorite direction, but it was very much in sync of where we probably would have gone, would be my guess. <clears throat> the thing that was more interesting, honestly, was I thought I knew how people would walk in the front of the building and how the different groups would move to like the cafeteria and the canteen to the conference rooms and then back to the elevators and up to upper levels. Um, as an architect, I think when I make a plan and build a 3D model, I know how people will move and I can predict it. And with a hundred percent accuracy, they, made all of the right moves and intuitively moved the way we thought they would. So that was just good validation of what we already knew. And I guess in a way, somehow, a lot of what you're talking about and also with this is you, you can track. There's these universal responses and ways of moving and ways of interacting with certain things, which is why I suppose it's easy to like system. Like, I mean, the, idea, the, the entire idea of like systems theory somehow is working on yeah. that. And I guess it's really interesting then when you see that Actually, yeah, when you say pretty much everybody had the same emotional responses. I mean, I guess there yeah. are certain ways, repetitive ways in which we have learned to interact within our space and the things that we need around us. And those are, can remain the same almost universally for a bit, maybe. Yep. And it, pretty soon we're going to announce um, some behaviors with the robots, but I'll, I'll say that um, things like how people hold a door and go through a door. It's something I know to leave space on both sides of a door because I've been taught that. Yeah. I think most architects know that people stand and hold a door for someone and wait on the other side. The specifics of how they do it when you measure 10,000 hours of people going through doors, it's surprising how little variation there is. Amazing. And Excellent. we don't even know. Yeah. 
We're not even aware of it. It's just hardwired into us. And we don't even think it. But we all do it the same way. It's very curious. It's amazing. It actually helps to, to even foster this feeling of community within architecture. Because I think we can all get so caught up in our own world and think, we do this and they don't do this. But to actually see the, yeah, the, the parts that come back and that are repetitive, that are just inherently and intrinsically human, and sort of how we, we interact with these things. It's, in, I actually have a question for you coming from that, because you mentioned Chuck Jones, and I love Chuck Jones, dot and a line. Oh, and great. it's one of just, he's amazing, he was amazing, right? And you said something that was interesting, which is the language of mobility. And I, it, I hadn't ever really thought about Chuck Jones in terms of architecture, I have to say, even though it makes sense when you see his work and just the design. But you keep talking about how what you're doing is not just having rooms be these beautiful spaces, but everything is about mobility. It's about how we interact. Do you feel like that this was something that was really missing in architecture for so long? Do you really feel like for a very long time people were just sort of going in with this very static idea of like what a building can do and didn't take into account of the, the movement, or do you think that we right now as a society are just moving more, which is kind of what's making this, this way of looking at architecture different? Well, well so I'm gonna always elevate architecture mm -hmm. as much as I can. So don't take this response too seriously. <laughs> but but what, I, what I think is, architects are really in this movement through space business and have been, they're very good at thinking about it actually, you know, much better than a software engineer or a transportation designer. We really pay attention a lot to thresholds between spaces and the character of spaces. Um, the problem is we just talk to each other and that knowledge doesn't get shared with other industries the way it should. And a lot of times when we talk, we have our own language. So when we do get an opportunity to talk to roboticists or transportation engineers or urban planners, they don't understand what we're saying and they think we just call us when you need the building. So I, I think it's very important that we use our expertise with spaces to solve a lot of these new mobility problems. Because what I see is it's more People spend a lot of time on screens and they move through spaces using screens and they find their friends and neighbors using screens. And I think architects could contribute to that screen and space um, dynamic, but they have to a little bit change what they think their job is. Mm. But I, I think our knowledge is there. It's just that there are new problems and you probably benefit from having an architect in the team somewhere to help you think them through. I mean, I guess that's also interesting when you brought in, once again, the Chuck Jones reference, what you're showing is all of these connections. Like, as you're saying, if, if these different industries would share their language, share their know-how, and that's happening more, also as a result of being online, that we can say, okay, what's actually working, not what's working in this corner for this corner, because certain human and emotional responses are repetitive and are able to be studied and trained. And yeah, that's actually quite interesting. There's, um, I just got another question in. And it is, there's a lot of data produced by measuring how people react to different environmental designs. Do you know how this data is used? For instance, what is what are the downsides of customer tracking? Do you know how oh, the data is being used? Yeah, no, massive. Are you or so, <laughs> yeah, no, no, massive. So. I mean, with, with our robots, we don't save data. The only data we save is odometry and things, and it's completely anonymized. Um, you know, and we don't sell our data. But the minute you start selling data, that's when things get very complicated. And um, I don't want to say sinister, but it's just spaces and places are getting really, really smart. And they're trying to predict what we want. And they're trying to predict and even provoke our behaviors. Um, and so we, we need to understand that these spaces aren't just inert, neutral things. I mean, the screens and the um, devices and our automobiles and scooters and all those things, they're collecting a lot of data and they're becoming more and more intelligent. And that intelligence is often um, unconscious to us. 
And, and so I, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, it's definitely something you want to think about from the perspective of the civic realm. And, and again, that's what architects, you know, I care about my clients, but they're not the first thing I think about. The first thing I think about is what is this building going to be for the next 50 or 100 years after this client's not in it anymore. I think more of the civic and just make sure that this, this particular client's happy. But not everybody cares about the civic. Yeah, makes sense. Well, that's actually the amount of time that we have right now for your q and I could go into this forever and ever. This is very interesting oh, as I knew it would be. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time and being with us, even with the time difference and the surgery. It's been really, really wonderful. And I'm really glad to participate. So thanks very much. Thanks for the great question. Thank you. Have a nice day over there. Right, you <laughs> See you. Bye. Bye.